Yeah. This one doesn't bark. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that's Tim Tam. Tim Tam. Tim. Oh, God, this one. Yeah. Oh. I, and they're off for food. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just got a new a new little toy from the Air Force shop. Oh yeah. A chew I, toy. I bought I bought a um a jacket, a flight jacket, <coughs> and this came with it. Oh, oh yes. Oh, <laughs> Oh, look at that. Yes. Oh, with in cans. Oh, yeah. Very nice. In cans. Um, look, ladies and gentlemen, we might just get a start, even though a couple of people might sort of drop in. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I don't, I'm not sort of officially dressed for this just because this is our last presentation for the year. But um, I'm emceeing uh, the Bomber Command uh, Association luncheon at Parliament House on, um, uh, and I've got to be up to Parliament House uh, soon. So um, once I introduce our, uh, our, our guest, um, I'll then hand over to Group Captain Fredo and, uh, and uh, then I'll, I'll bid my farewells. But I will be, look I will be looking at um, Peter, of course, as, as always, thank you, Peter, is recording it all, so I'll have a look at it after that. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Kerry Neal. Kerry works as a curator in the military and heraldry and tech and technology section of the, the Australian War Memorial. So welcome, Kerry. I'm very, very honoured to have you here. Oh, thank you, Mary. Uh, Kerry joined the Memorial in 2004 and has worked in various roles, including the visitor services, historical research and gallery development. Kerry graduated with first class honours and, and the University Medal in History from the Australian National University in 2007. Congratulations, Kerry. She completed her PhD in 2015 through the University of New South Wales, and her thesis was investigating the experiences of disfigured Great War veterans in Britain and the Dominions. Very young, um, very noble thesis. Uh, uh, must be very interesting. Uh, so, Kerry, welcome. Um, welcome to our, our, our group um, and uh, the Friends of Air Force History and Heritage, and delighted to have you here. And um, so my apologies, I'll have to pull out uh, soon after you, you begin your presentation. So um, uh, as I hand it over, do you want me to hand over to you now, sir? And uh, All right, yeah. let's, um, Kerry, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the invitation to join you on your last meeting of the year. Um, it has certainly been a very interesting year, to say the least. So it's lovely to kind of wrap up with something um, like this, where I hope I do see a lot of furry friends uh, across the mountains as we, we chat this morning. So I am here this morning to, to speak about animals in war. And I think it's important to note, um, instead of it being animals at war, animals never really get to choose whether they're a part of these conflicts. Um, and so to me, I always think about this idea that we relate to animals as being brave and loyal um, and companions and all of the roles that I'll talk about this morning. But it's something that we as humans actually are asking them to do. They don't get to sort of sign up um, as service personnel do. So I think it's important to kind of come into this chat this morning, noting that that distinction. Um, so this morning is going to be a little bit choppy. I'm going to kind of cover quite a lot of conflicts. Um, I didn't just want to focus on, on one conflict over another. Um, and I'm going to kind of take you through basically items that we've got in the collection that really draw that relationship between animals and humans um, in times of conflict. So we'll get started with one animal um, or, or bird in this instance that I think a lot of people immediately associate with the First World War. And that is the good old uh, flying rat or pigeon, <laughs> as they're, they're more well known. Um, now, they actually served a really important role in communications, and this can actually be traced all the way back to um, sort of the classical period, in that the idea of a homing pigeon that could be silent, difficult to intercept, um, and not significantly affected by gas or noise, which is really important when you think about um, particularly trench warfare in the First World War. And they could be trained to home on mobile lofts. So in other words, if 
um, men were, were moving through along trench lines and they needed a pigeon to be able to home back into wherever they were moving to. So they were used in great numbers um, during the First World War. And what you can see here are just a few of the instances in how they were transported and also how they were set out. So you can see that they've just, one of them's just been released um, from the side of a tank. And then you can also see these carriers um, that were used as they were moving through the lines. So quite remarkable. We, we do have a few um, mounted pigeons in the collection, uh, as well as a few of these carriers. Um, but then if we move back to uh, another conflict, and as technology, particularly wireless, um, radar, advanced since the First World War, it was thought that in, by 1939 that pigeons really wouldn't serve a purpose anymore. However, it was realised that this new equipment could still fail in a lot of circumstances and that messenger carrying pigeons were still going to be reinstated um, as a very useful part of those communication lines. By 1942, the threat of enemy invasion in Australia led civilian pigeon fanciers uh, to voluntarily establish a network that could carry messages in the event that radio contact failed if Australia actually fell to the enemy. And so later that year, later in 1942, the Australian Corps of Signals Pigeon Service was established. And it was soon realised that this successful service might also be of use to the Army overseas particularly in the Southwest Pacific area. So the birds obviously could fly over the tropical oceans, mountains and jungles that were proving to be really quite difficult for the Signal Corps' usual communication methods. So for example, um, the 8th Signal, the 8th Australian Pigeon Section was sent to Port Moresby in December 1942 to support operations along the Kokoda Trail. And the pigeons were trained to carry a message for up to 193 kilometres at an average speed of about 48 kilometres an hour, which is just incredible um, to my mind. And they were particularly useful in emergency situations where there was no opportunity to, to lay cable lines um, or pretty much any other method of communication. And so again, what you can see here is one of the baskets that was used um, to carry these pigeons along. Um, to transport them by, in the field by the Army Signals units. And a small number of the birds would be placed in a smaller basket to then be carried by a fighting unit or a boat operating in coastal waters. So you'd basically be sending a large number of the birds and then they would be separated out um, to go along with particular units. And so both the, the large and the small um, basket versions had little detachable feed and water troughs that could be attached to the sides and the birds would just pop their heads through um, those openings that you can see, the sort of longer window pieces um, to eat or drink. So they were, they were very much well looked after and very highly valued um, in their role. So moving again into the First World War, and we have a look here at the ships of the desert. And we have a mounted hide of a camel um, held in the collection. You can just see that in the top right corner. Because they were so suited to their heat and the lack of water and the soft desert sand, um, they could also carry a heavy loads than horses. The operations of the Imperial Camel Corps in the Western Desert in 1916 were characterised by very long patrols and brief skirmishes. Um, British commanders in Egypt appreciated the fighting qualities of the Imperial Camel Corps, the ICC, and in late 1916, the ICC was transferred to the Sinai Desert to take part in operations against the Turkish army. So here, the battalions of the ICC fought alongside the Australian Light Horse units at Romani, Bagdaba, and Rafa. So they were an integral part of the British and Dominion forces that advanced through the, through the Palestine area in 1917 and 18. The ICC though, suffered particularly heavily during the Second Battle of Gaza in April 1917. As the ICC moved into the more fertile country of Northern Palestine, it, it practically declined. The camels needed more fodder and water than the equivalent number of horses would need. 
and unimpeded by the desert, horses could then move faster. Um, so you can see um, on the left there, a loaded camel train heading into the desert. Um, and they were basically an important part of supply line progress um, moving through. Um, this is the, the second of a series of eight paintings that if you'd come along and seen the First World War galleries in the earlier iterations, um, we had that really long Palestine diorama of the Camel Corps and a few of the other um, different corps that were fighting in that area. And then you can see here that the white camel, um, that painting at the, the base there, um, these are actually being used as British lifeguards since 1881. And since that time, there had been a school at Abyssinia for teaching British soldiers how to ride and handle camels. Um, so this was the school that was revived in 1916. So moving then from the ships of the desert to those that they were working alongside. And if we go back a conflict to the Boer War, so the first Australian troops arrived in South Africa in December 1899. Now 500 members of the Queensland Mounted Infantry and the New South Wales Lancers took part in the relief of Kimberley in February 1900. And men of the New South Wales Mounted Rifles played a part in the last major battle of the war at Pardenburg in the same month. So after a series of defeats in 1900, the Boer armies became fragmented, forming groups of highly mobile commandos that harassed British troop movements and supply lines. Now faced with this type of warfare, the British commanders quickly became reliant on mounted troops from Britain and the colonies. After Federation in Australia, the state of New South Wales provided troops for four of the eight regiments of the Australian Commonwealth Horse, as well as the Australian medical team. So the first contingents of New South Wales were made up of volunteers from three New South Wales mounted regiments, the militia, and in the case of A Battery, were professional soldiers from the New South Wales artillery. These recruits therefore were already familiar with soldier discipline and drill. However, this was certainly not the case with the later Bushmen contingents, who were mainly civilians that had volunteered for service. Instruction camps were established at places like Randwick in Sydney, where men were taught to drill, trained in musketry, squadron work, and the duties of the horsemen were mounted and dismounted. So it's very important to realise that a lot of what was actually carried out by the mounted infantry was actually done off their horses. Um, so horses were selected, purchased and handed over to their riders, who were also then responsible for stable duty. Each unit was organised into squadrons, squadrons into troops and troops into sections. And so the second regiment of the New South Wales Mounted Rifles was established in Sydney and then was serving in South Africa. So this Mounted Rifles consisted of five Mounted Rifle squadrons, but unlike the second, sorry, unlike the first Mounted Rifles, this one also had a machine gun section. So the preference for recruits for this was for trained men who were, and I quote, good shots and good riders. So they needed to be between the ages of 20 and 40, five foot six inches or taller, and have a chest measurement of 34 inches or larger. So they were certainly looking to be athletic horsemen who would be able to handle um, their ride. So A Squadron was raised as a mounted rifle squadron and consisted of four officers and a hundred other ranks, described as especially smart men, good shots, and daring riders. And they went in with 104 horses. So conditions for both soldiers and horses were harsh, as you can see in the, uh, the images here. Without time to acclimatise to the severe environment and in an army with a greatly overstrained logistic system, the horses fared badly. Many died, not just in battle, but of disease and others succumbed to exhaustion and starvation on those long treks across the veld. Quarantine regulations in Australia ensured that even those which did survive could not return home. And so in the early stages of war, Australian, soldier loss, Australian soldiers' losses were so high through illness that components of the first and second contingents ceased to exist after a few months of service. 
So you may have actually seen um, this hide that we've got um, of the horse in the old ball wall galleries, which were downstairs. Um, and then we also have another mounted hide from a horse from the First World War. And this one is typical of the whalers used by light horsemen in the campaign in the Middle East during the First World War. The light horse combined the mobility of cavalry with the fighting skills of the infantry. They fought dismounted with rifles and bayonets. However, they did sometimes charge on horseback, notably at Magdeba and Bathsheba. The smallest unit of a light horse regiment was the four man section, one holding the horses while the other three would fight. The horses were called whalers because although they, they came from all parts of Australia, they were originally sold through New South Wales. They were sturdy, hardy horses, able to travel long distances in hot weather with little water. So again, you can see that comparison actually between um, the conditions that camels would work well in. So whalers had very similar um, ability. Horses usually need to drink about 30 litres of water a day. However, during the campaign, they often went for up to 60 hours without water at all. While carrying a load almost 130 kilograms, comprising of the rider, also their saddle, equipment, food and water. Whalers invariably had a full mane and tail, which helped them to deter flies and insects. And the horse on display at the memorial has actually had his mane cut off, if you can see in that image there. Um, but that was done later with clippers, um, known as, as being hogged, which was fashionable from the 1930s to the late 1960s. Um, similarly, the horse's tail, you might notice, has been banged, which is cut in a, in a very straight line. Um, so this hide, whilst being from the First World War, actually represents um, a few of the more stylized, uh, I guess, a, a stylized appearance from a little bit later, the 1930s. So this horse and rider, as they're set up, are equipped for the period 1916 to 17. In 1918, rifle buckets were introduced in some units. Um, and so that leather bucket was attached to the saddle and the rifle sat in that as opposed to being slung over the rider's back. So this particular hide, this horse was purchased um, in Australia by British Army agents in late 1924 at the age of four and shipped to Egypt where he arrived at the beginning of 1925. Assigned the army number 71028, the horse served mainly in Egypt with a few short periods in Palestine and was attached to the British unit as a troop horse. So although 12 years was the standard age for a military riding horse to be retired from the army, when those fit for further work were sold on and those unfit for further work were humanely destroyed, British mounted units in the 1930s were gradually becoming more mechanised. Many of those units had abandoned the use of many of their horses by 1936, which may explain why this horse was retained beyond their normal retirement age. So rather than going to the expense of obtaining fresh horses required for only a limited period of time. So in the mid 1930s, as the new building for the Australian War Memorial began to take shape in Canberra, it was suggested that a mounted hide of a horse um, similar to that that would have been used in the First World War would be an appropriate vehicle on which to display the figure of a light horseman to represent the Sinai and Palestine campaigns. At that time, there were no taxidermists in Australia who were capable of preparing such a large animal. So it was suggested that a British firm um, actually be asked to prepare the hide of a typical British horse, um, which explains why even though this horse um, didn't physically serve in the First World War, he represents um, that style. And so when consulted, General Sir Henry Chevelle, who had commanded the Desert Mounted Corps in Palestine, was adamant that the horse selected must be an Australian bred remount, that it should be brown, bay or chestnut. And the only Australian remounts in the British Army at this time were in India and Egypt. And so this horse from Egypt was selected because it was closer to the firm, the, the taxidermist firm in London. The horse was chosen from number offered by the British Army, uh, destroyed in late 1936, and the hide mounted in London. The completed animal arrived in Australia at the beginning of 1938, 
and was installed in the Australian War Memorial when it opened in 1941 and has since basically remained on display for that entire time. At the end of the First World War, Australians had 13,000 surplus horses which could not be returned home for quarantine reasons. Of these, 11,000 were sold, the majority as remounts for the British Army in India, and 2,000 were cast for age or infirmity. So just as a little sidebar here, um, one of a, a really interesting object in the collection is actually this horse gas mask. Um, and even though the specific history of this gas mask is unknown, it was one of 23 collected by the Australian War Records section from an abandoned German supplies in May 1919. So this type of mask has no canister, but it is likely to have been soaked in a chemical such as phenol um, before use to give protection to the animal from the dangerous gases used um, during the First World War. The mask actually also demonstrates use of ersatz or substitute material by the Germans um, when their supplies and, and resources were dwindling. So it was developed um, that sort of made from a combination of, of paper and cotton or even wool rags um, that were used in place of traditional fabrics. So both in civilian and military applications. And we can see here how the um, military has used these substitute products. But it's quite remarkable. I, I do wonder how the horses would have gone wearing those. Um, it's not the lightest looking thing. Um, it does have a bit of weight to it. And obviously when it would have been soaked in um, that chemical, that would have added to its weight as well. Um, it's a shame that we don't have any Australian examples, but at least we have um, this piece from, from the German supplies. So moving along now to our furry companions, the dog. Um, obviously there is a great relationship that is known between um, man, and, man and dog, um, but that's certainly seen throughout the First and Second World Wars in a number of different roles. Um, whether as a mascot, whether as simply a companion, or as I'll talk about in um, a, a little bit, a little bit um, as a messenger uh, as well. So these are just some unidentified um, images that we have in the collection from the First World War, um, seated with their, their mascots. And then with the, the idea of the messenger dog, um, the hide that we have on display in the galleries, Roff, um, as you can see here on the, on the right. So in May 1918, Corporal Roach and Private Conway of C Company 13 Battalion AIF were in an advanced post in trenches just outside Villers Bretonneau that enticed this German messenger dog into their lines. The dog had a message on its collar when it was captured, which was quickly removed and sent to headquarters for translation but the dog also escaped. He was recaptured shortly later though by D Company and the message he carried was from a German platoon commander in the front line, complaining that his men were tired and hadn't had food for 48 hours. His company commander had folded it back and written, Weber has been in longer than you and does not complain. We will send you food tonight. Give Roth any further messages. He does not complain. So this really great little um, humorous back and forth through the German messenger dog. Roth remained at the Australian unit as a mascot from May to September, attached to the quartermaster stores. A set of harness and an improvised cart were made for him by the section, and he used to actually carry stores for the staff until unfortunately he became um, quite aggressive and was sent to England with a view of having him transferred to the Sydney Zoo. Um, Colonel Marks from the 13th Battalion placed him in quarantine at the Bittenau Manor Farm um, in Southampton, England on 19th of September 1918, where he was cared for by the veterinary officer for the Commonwealth of Australia. Unfortunately though, it was soon discovered that regulations forbade the importation of dogs to Australia, and so Roth had to remain at the kennels. Sadly, he developed a big abscess on the side of his neck in September 1919, which although apparently healed, he developed a swelling on each side of the throat and became extremely thin. 
He died on the night of 14, 15 October 1919. A couple of days later, though, it was decided to have him stuffed and mounted um, by the, the very same um, taxidermist that had stuffed the, um, that later came to stuff the horse hide. And this was done at a cost of eight pounds. So the mounting was completed in November 1919, and that, then he was sent to Australia, where he was displayed at the War Museum in Sydney during the 1920s. And he's still on display now. He has had some time in rest. Um, obviously, his, his hide was not necessarily as healthy because he had deteriorated uh, so much. So every so often he has to um, have a rest before he can be back on display in the galleries. Now here is actually one of one of my personal favourite objects in the collection, um, just because of its uniqueness and and the visual idea of this mask with the little ears. And again, we're looking at a German gas mask. Um, and so this is for messenger dogs during the First World War. So as we noted with the horses, it was not just human soldiers on the Western Front who needed protection from these new dangers of chemical warfare. Animals were also very vulnerable. So collected from the battlefield by a member of the 34th, 30, 41st Battalion, sorry, language not happening this morning, Australian Imperial Force, this gas mask was made for a German messenger dog. The Allied naval blockade of Germany had forced the Germans to develop the substitute materials that I spoke about earlier. And this is another example of an ersatz um, fabric. Although the mask has no filter, it may have been soaked again in that phenol um, to give the protection. It seems that the fabric had been machine quilted to give additional stiffness to keep that um, shape of the dog's face. And that way it would mean that the end of the snout um, wouldn't collapse on the, the, the dog that was wearing it as well. It's unclear exactly when the mask was collected, but its existence certainly demonstrates the importance that was held for dogs during the war making their way through the maze of trenches spread throughout the Western Front, dogs proved to be as reliable as soldiers in the dangerous job of running messages, and quite often were seen to be sometimes faster, whether as messengers, guards or mascots, or simply by providing companionships to the men in trenches, dogs served many vital roles. And you can see here just a few examples of photos from the National Collection that show just that, um, this relationship for dogs as mascots or just companionship. Now you may have heard this story before, it's the story of Hori, um, originally known as the Wog Dog, now known as the War Dog, was the mascot and campaigner of the 2nd 1st Machine Gun Battalion. And you can see him down here um, in his little travelling pack shortly before the unit returned to Australia. Now, Hurry was adopted by Private Jim Moody and travelled everywhere with the unit. His travelling pack was lined with wood and had slits were cut in the back for ventilation. This pack was actually used to smuggle Hurry back to Australia in 1942. Um, and these have also been on display uh, quite a number of times. You can actually see that on um, Hurry's little coat that he's got um, stripes and also one of the, uh, the metal ribbons as well as a colour patch at the top. So you can see a lot of love and care went into the relationship that the unit had with Hori. Moving through um, conflicts, if we have a look at the role that dogs played um, during Vietnam, 11 tracker dogs were sent over um, to help track the enemy in Vietnam from 1967 until 1971 and they were among the most popular with the Australian forces. Caesar, who you can see here, went everywhere with his handler, Private Peter Harron, and were part of the tracker team, which comprised of another dog and handler, two trackers, two visual trackers, a signaller and a machine gunner. So just a few um, stories here of the dogs who actually came in to the Vietnam War. In order of arrival in Vietnam, the, do the dogs were all named after um, Roman sort of leaders. We had Caesar, Cassius, Justin, Marcus, Tiber, Janus, Julian, Milo, Trajan, Juno, and Marcion. 
Now, most of these were trained from about the age of 10 months at the tracking wing of the Ingleburn Infantry Centre in New South Wales and came from a variety of sources, including the local pounds. Two dogs were assigned to each of the Australian battalions based at the task force base at Nui Dat. Full-time use of the dogs in Vietnam from late 1967 followed their successful use in Malaya in the 1950s and a trial in Vietnam during most of 1967. Housed in kennels at Nui Dat, the dogs' lives followed an established routine. They were groomed and checked every day taken outside the base perimeter for training runs on tracks set up through the bush. And South Vietnamese soldiers were usually used to set scent trails so the dogs could get used to following a distinctive smell. As I mentioned, each tracker team, consisting of the two dogs and the handlers, operated on standby out of Nui Dat. Usually called out to follow up enemy trails or to locate suspected enemy hideouts, the teams would be airlifted by helicopter into the area of operation. And you can see here them coming out of the helicopter um, on a tracking mission. The dogs apparently loved these helicopter flights, finding the cool air a relief from the oppressive tropical heat that they would experience on the ground. Once on the ground, the dogs would be put on the scent of retreating em enemy. The dogs would follow the scent, usually at a high speed until the location was found. When the dog would stop, with their nose or paw extended in the point fashion, facing the suspected hideout. The tracker and dog would then fall back while the rest of the section searched the area, often finding wounded enemy or recently occupied bunker systems that would otherwise have been completely missed. The dogs were incredibly successful at their combat tasks in Vietnam. Apart from their success in locating enemy and their support systems, the dogs saved the lives of their handlers and team members on many occasions. Although not trained to detect mines, despite recommendations by some soldiers that they were actually, um, that mine dogs could be used in Vietnam, the dogs were intelligent and sufficiently well trained to do so. Handler Haring summed up his dog's worth, and I'll just quote what he says here. Caesar could see, smell and hear Charlie long before we walked into a firefight. He knew where the mines were, where the trip wires were strung, and he could cover ground chasing the enemy at speeds, which literally took your breath away. So you can see just how highly held in regard he was. The fate of Australia's war dogs, once their service came to an end in Vietnam, caused a great division in, a, in army circles and anguish to their handlers. Unlike their human counterparts, the length of duty for a tracker dog was around three years. Um, this made it impossible for dogs to return to Australia when their handlers tour ended. The main reason for keeping the dogs in country was the army's reluctance to cover the quarantine costs involved. And there's a, a piece from the Melbourne Herald um, from May 1969 that really kind of sort of puts this all together. There is a shell-shocked digger who will be in Vietnam until he dies. He is Private Tiber, a Black Labrador tracker dog. Tiber is a casualty of Viet Cong attack in May last year. A rocket-propelled grenade burst only a few feet away from him. Since then, he has been gun-shy. Sometimes he jumps, whimpering into a ditch when Australian artillery or mortars fire. So you can really see that these dogs um, were suffering in the same sorts of conditions as their human handlers, um, but as opposed to the shorter rotations that the human handlers were um, experiencing, the dogs were there for a much longer period of time. So after much discussion about the issue, um, and with the matter having been raised in Parliament, the Army decided in 1968 that at the end of their working lives, the dogs would be kept by the battalion as a reserve and then actually given as pets to European or Australian uh, residents in Saigon. Only as a last resort, if no home could be found, um, would the animal be put down. In the event, none of the 11 dogs who were served in Nam were put down, with homes being found for the 10 who survived. Um, one dog, Cassius, died of heat exhaustion um, after a training run. Having to part with their dogs at the end of their tours was often the hardest part for the handlers. 
Some likened it actually to losing a child. Um, Dennis Ferguson trained Marcus in Australia and then served with who he called his mate during two tours in Vietnam. Ferguson applied through all of the appropriate army channels to take Marcus home with him, um, even offering to pay all of the quarantine costs. Unfortunately, the refusal that he received with no reasons given um, caused Ferguson trauma that he still felt very deeply for, for many, many years afterwards. The family of Gary Palazzi, the handler of Julian, had a similar experience. Um, he was accidentally killed in Vietnam in April 1968 and his mother applied to have the dog brought home after his son's death. She wanted that, that connection um, to her son. After questions were again raised in Parliament and the family conducted a public campaign that raised enough money um, to have put uh, Julian sorry, through all of the quarantine costs, the army confirmed its policy on the fate of the dogs and refused um, the request for him to come to Australia. These refusals might have been easier to bear had the handlers been told one apparent reason for them. An army veterinary report noted that the large number of American tracker dogs in Vietnam had died from tropical disease. This disease, which had quickly caused massive hemorrhaging in, in major organs, was hard to detect and could be carried by dogs without symptoms for some time. So this report um, on the American tracker dogs recommended that they not be allowed back into America um, and even under strict quarantine. And so this same policy was then held for the Australian tracker dogs. By the end of 1972, the majority of Australian troops, including the dog handlers, were home from Vietnam. As I said, though, homes were found uh, with families for 10 out of the 11 dogs. And you can see here um, one, of the, uh, one of the dogs, Tiber, um, that had found his, his home with a family in Saigon. So this is a former army tracker dog in his new home at the Australian Embassy where he lived in retirement. And you can actually see if you can look, um, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow pointing here, uh, but he's actually got his Vietnam campaign ribbons on his collar. In a far more recent conflict, again, you see incredibly strong bonds um, developing between handlers and their dogs. And in this instance, it's the explosive detection dogs used in Afghanistan. And quite simply, these dogs save lives. Um, the dogs help their handlers to find improvised explosive devices, ammunition and caches of weapons. To be trained for this role, dogs have to already demonstrate a keen instinct to hunt, to play and retrieve. Unfortunately, a number of EDDs um, have been killed while on active service in Afghanistan and their names are inscribed on the sculpture that sits in the Australian War Memorial grounds which also commemorates handler's sapper Darren Smith, who was killed in Afghanistan with his beloved dog, Herbie. So from dogs to cats, and the ship's cat in particular has been a common feature on trading, exploration and naval ships dating back to ancient times. Cats have been carried on ships for many reasons, the most important being to catch mice and rats. These rodents aboard a ship can cause damage to ropes, to woodwork, and eventually, as technology progressed, electrical wiring. They also threaten the stores um, of food that the ships carried. And so, of course, the idea of a cat on a ship um, keeping this mice and, and rats issue um, is incredibly important. The natural ability of cats to adapt to surra new surroundings also made them suitable for, for service on a ship. They offered companionship and a sense of home and security and camaraderie to sailors who could be away from home for incredibly long periods, especially in times of war. And so you can see here um, that the ship, uh, ship's captain had even made little hammocks for the, uh, the, the ship's cats. And just some wonderful photos from the collection showing that relationship 
um, and the friendship that the cats could bring to all kinds of service personnel over different periods of time. And then the tradition of a black cat being bad luck um, has actually, we've got examples here of, of quite the reverse and black cats being very good luck. And so we've got some of these good luck tokens from the First World War. Um, and these, these are quite tiny. The one up in the, the right hand corner is probably not much higher than maybe an inch. Um, and so these were often carried by soldiers as kind of a memento from home, but also as a little good luck charm. Looking now at a very iconic Australian animal and their role in war, um, kangaroos in particular have been used as mascots um, since the First World War. And you can just see here various photographs of uh, kangaroos that have been taken outside of Australia um, as a reminder of home and as mascots for different units. So from the First World War, um, now the first Australia Day was actually held on the 30th of July, 1915. Um, and that was actually more of a fundraiser um, than what we know of a, as Australia Day um, in more recent times. So this Australia Day was used to raise funds for wounded Australians um, from the Gallipoli campaign. And you can see the little um, badge with the tricolored ribbon around the neck um, was actually sold as a, a fundraiser. During the First World War, money was often raised for patriotic funds by setting aside a special day um, on which activities such as auctions, street collections, and stalls were held to encourage the community to contribute. And this little token um, was one that was sold during that time. So badges like this, along with buttons and ribbons, were commonly sold at those kinds of events. And then um, the soft toy that you can see on the left there is representative of the types of toys sold by a young schoolgirl, Miss Gwendolyn Alpress of Elizabeth Bay in New South Wales, um, who sold these during the First World War. So she would make these um, and actually donated all of the funds that she made uh, to different soldier um, support groups. So she actually donated quite a few of these pieces and a couple of the ribbons and buttons that she collected during her time to the memorial in the 1960s. Um, she certainly came across as a dedicated and involved supporter of the many wartime fundraisers. And so given her role as an authorised assistant at the 1915 Australia Day fundraising event, it's likely that this little badge dates from that same year. If we move to sort of post-1945 conflicts, this beer mug, um, the Doug mug that you can see there, um, was presented to Flight Lieutenant Douglas Charles Hurst during his service with 77 Squadron in Korea. Um, he enlisted with the Royal Australian Air Force and in July 1943 graduated as a sergeant pilot from number 33 course five flying training school and was posted to 80 squadron where he flew Kitty Hawks on fighter bomber operations from bases in New Guinea and the islands. By the end of the war, he had been commissioned as a pilot officer. He elected to remain in the RAAF post-war and in 1947, volunteered to be a part of the aerial component of the British Commonwealth Occupation Force or BCOF in Japan. He served with 82 Squadron based in Bafu and equipped with Mustangs until late 1948 um, when he returned to Australia. After the conversion to jets, he actually flew Meteors as a flight lieutenant with 77 Squadron again in Korea during 1952. And he was actually awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and the US Air Medal for Gallantry in his ground attack operations. Uh, he later st served on staff duties in Malaya, commanded 76 Squadron flying CAC Sabres, and was Australian Air Attaché in Washington from 1964 to 66. Uh, he retired from the RAAF in 1970 with the rank of Group Captain. And I just love that little kangaroo there with the 
the, the helmet as well as the fact that he's holding the, the mug that he's on. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, an inception moment. Um, you can then see the name badge of Dorothy Angel, a civilian nurse with the Australian surgical team in Vietnam. And so often we see kangaroos used as a ready um, symbol to identify Australian uh, forces and service personnel. Um, even down to more recently, um, this first aid kit with the two bandaged kangaroos placed on top of the lid uh, has come from Kandahar province in Afghanistan. So we, while we don't necessarily know the stories behind some of these photographs, I just thought it was um, really interesting to show you some of the other more unusual mascots that turn up in the National Collection. Um, so you can see on, from, from left to right, Nap, the monkey, who was the 21st Battalion's mascot at Bucourt in France in April 1918. Um, then you have Septimus, the unit mascot of A Squadron, um, he was a baby possum that was found and reared by this gentleman, Trooper Groves. And then uh, on the right, you've got a turtle named Tim, who was the mascot of the 2nd 2nd Battalion. Um, and this photo was from March 1940. So along um, all of these wanted and appreciated animals, um, I thought it was kind of important to also mention some of the ones that aren't as appreciated and welcomed. Um, obviously, the idea of, of rats and trenches sort of go hand in hand. Um, and I don't need to go into that too much, but the cartoons and the posters that were around from the First and Second World Wars that spoke about the dangers of the rats um, and the, the annoyance of mice and things in the trenches really just highlights the, the frustration for some of the service personnel. But then if we talk about other pests and insects that you really can't avoid um, in times of conflict and the sort of living conditions that service personnel might find themselves in. Um, there's just a few things here, particularly from the First World War, that I thought I might point out that you might not expect to see in the um, War Memorials National Collection. Things like this mosquito netting um, that was worn by Matron Uren from the Australian Army Nursing Service, um, AIF or a disinfectant tin that you can see here um, that had been collected from Gallipoli. It was actually issued to troops um, to combat lice and flies. However, due to the difficulties in getting access to water and living in the trenches, um, particularly when you think that they were living uh, around the remains of dead soldiers, um, insects remained constant irritants to the troops throughout the campaign. Um, you've got some insect repellent canisters um, that would have been used particularly from 1944 that was issued by the Australian Army and also this mosquito repellent lotion um, that was used by Sergeant Fenton from the 2nd 1st Topographical, um, Topographical sorry, Survey Company and it was associated with his service in New Guinea. And then we have um, some snakes and lizards not the real ones, um, but the use of those uh, as crafts and um, patterns that you see from the First World War. And in particular, here are two examples of beadwork made by Ottoman prisoners of war in a British POW camp, um, probably from uh, an area in Egypt. So except for some fatigue duties, prisoners were generally not required to work and so making these kinds of craft items um, helped to pass the time. And so the prisoners also used these to make a little bit of money um, in selling them to um, the, the Australian service personnel who were um, looking after them in the POW camps. And so we've got quite a lot of these in the National Collection. They were brought back home by many um, men on their return as souvenirs. But then to the living snakes, um, and these were, were certainly an issue in the Southwest Pacific area during the Second World War and in Vietnam. Um, and we've just got some photos here of different interactions um, with some of the Australians who came up against these um, creepy crawlies. So the, in particular, um, the, the photograph on the far left um, is the biggest cobra um, that was killed by Australian troops. 
The snake was caught and killed running in a running night battle when it slithered into an occupied four-man tent. Um, and it was around 11 feet from head to tail. So the man who shot the snake was Sergeant Len Yago of Stafford in Brisbane. Um, so quite, and you can almost see the look on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> that the gentleman in the middle there is is not at all impressed with it even though it is dead <laughs> um, and then on the the right hand side you can see the gentleman there with his as he describes it his personal collection of snakes so when he was not on duty as a cook with the 12th field regiment um, private Grendel um, would actually collect and present these collections of snakes around the base so I also thought that it was important to mention um, the Animals VC in closing, and this is the Dickin Medal. So it was instituted by Mrs. Maria Dickin, the founder of the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, or the PDSA in England. And it was awarded for any animal displaying, and I'll just read the description here, conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty associated with or under the control of any branch of the armed forces or civilian defense during the first world, sorry, during the second world war and its aftermath. So this medal has been awarded 65 times since 1943. And the recipients comprise of 32 pigeons, 29 dogs, three horses and one cat. And at least two Australian carrier pigeons attached to the Australian army have received the Dickin medal. And this is actually the one, the Dickin Medal that we have um, in the Australian War Memorials collection. So just in closing up, um, I think that it's really important, along with all of these um, collection items, to also pause and think about the legacy of this relationship with animals that's shown in times of war. And you can actually see that that's come through in a lot of popular culture today. And it really highlights that enduring nature of the relationship between service personnel and the animals that either work alongside them or provide them with that companionship. And also just the important role that animals have played in war. So I might leave it at that point this morning. Um, and if anybody's got any questions, take those. Thank you, Kerry, a fascinating presentation. Before we go on, everyone a round of applause for Kerry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I open up the floor, I suppose one thing I was going to um, just make a note of was when you were talking about the pigeons. And yes. I only discovered this recently that when the Catalinas were doing their operations up into the Philippines and South China Sea during World War II, that they would carry pigeons on board to release. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, just um, I'd only discovered that recently, and I was wondering, knowing how fast the Catalinas could go, the the pigeons would probably go faster. So, <laughs> and I suppose the other one is you also mentioned Doug Hurst and his time in Korea. Yeah. Um, and Lloyd Knight, who was with us, would have probably served with Doug, wouldn't have you, Lloyd? He was there the year before I was. Ah. Oh. <laughs> I was only fifty-three. Yeah. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I'll open up to any questions. Gary, um, just a comment rather than a question, following on from what um, Fredo just mentioned about the carrier pigeons. My father-in-law, uh, John Gulowich, DFC, he's an ex-pilot of G for George, the one that right. was on display in the War Memorial. Um, he crash-landed a, a Lancaster bomber at Hawking, a little fighter field in Kent. Mm -hmm. He bounced, it was such a small field, he bounced over the end of the runway end of a uh, pumpkin patch and broke the back of the aircraft they all got out one bloke had a bit of a knock on the head but then my father-in-law pointed to one of the crew members and said you need to go back in and recover the carrier pigeon so he went back and rescued the carrier pigeon out of the aircraft uh, yeah do we have any questions from anyone else in the audience Kerry I'd like to make a comment please absolutely um, at the Shrine of Remembrance at Melbourne, there is a wonderful memorial to horses and um, it has a, a light above it and a, a small touch and poem mm -hmm. about that they serve so silently. I can't remember the exact words, but it's 
they're, they're touching words. And um, for anyone that's in Melbourne, um, we've got a museum at the shrine as well now. Um, yes. Yeah. It, it'd be good if you could um, call by and see that memorial to horses. Mm, I agree, Richard. I, I have seen that one myself and it is very moving. Um, we have a few sculptures in the memorials ground here in Canberra as well um, to animals. We've got uh, three now, actually, with the explosive detection dog um, memorial being one of the more recent ones. And it actually shows a handler at nose to nose level with his um, EDD. And it's, it's a beautiful sculpture in bronze and it just that look between the two of them, between the handler and the dog, is is something that you can see the relationship between them. Um, yeah, it's quite special. Ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? There was a lot to take in. Sorry. <laughs> a lot of little pieces and I didn't want to miss anything and have somebody go, what about the what about the rats? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> surprised to see the cats in there <laughs> oh no well i'm i'm a cat lover well actually i'm an animal lover myself but you know you can't leave the cats out they play an important role on the ships it is. yes yes uh, asking for a friend um, whatever happened to simpson's donkey which would be one of the most uh best known animals in australian military history short answer we don't actually know Longer answer is that there are different theories um, about whether uh, the donkey was was killed or wounded um, in a particular action, um, whether he was rehomed um, to kind of a, a family. Um, there's there's well, a... he wasn't Australian, of course. He was British. British, yes. Um, so no, I can't really give you an answer on that one. Sorry. <laughs> And there is, there's also the theory that there were more than there was more than one donkey that was used by Simpson as well. So, which which donkey do we we know the um, the end story about? We we don't actually know. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Look, I don't think there's any more questions. Um, just want to again say thank you very much for Kerry. Uh, a fantastic presentation to end this year, um, known as COVID Year Two. So thank you very much. Um, just for everyone, as of next year, we're moving from doing these on the Friday mornings and we're going to be coordinating them being done in conjunction with the AHSA. So we've already got two lined up. Um, the one in March is going to be delivered by Wing Commander Matt Shelley, who's the OIC of the RAF Museum. We'll be talking about the current and future visions of where the museum's going, which is timely because we'll just be about to open up again down there. And later in the year, we've already organised, I think it's September, we've got um, Dr. Kristen Alexander is going to talk about Clyde oh. Paul, her research. Oh, I know uh, Dr. Alexander. Yeah. <laughs> She's here in Canberra. <laughs> she is. So um, during the course of the year, we'll probably actually fill some other ones up and um, we'll be, as I said, doing it in conjunction with the AHSA, both or the Victorian, New South Wales and possibly the Queensland group up there with Peter Dunn. Um, so spreading the love around and by doing it on the night time, it means we can get more people attending and also um, open up the discussion for the members of the AHSA. So if there's no nothing further from anyone, um, I'll call this session closed again, saying thank you very much to Kerry. My pleasure. Wish, Thanks for having me. And wish everyone a happy new year. Oh, Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Thank all right, everyone. Thank you again, and um, all the best. Have a great, okay. have a great Christmas, New Year, and thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Cheers. Kerry. Thanks, Greta. Merry okay. Christmas to all. Merry Christmas. Bye.